I'm very happy to do this lecture this evening. And this lecture is different, it's a purely personal reflection on doing science in India. But what has happened with India is something interesting. In five minutes I'll summarize it. I will not go through the progress report of India, no. I think we all know that. We have no institutions. Don't forget, the entire state of Mysore, Mysore state those days, there's no Karnataka, Maharashtra there, had one college for science and one college for arts. And if you want to do engineering, there's one engineering college in that. Today there are 67 engineering colleges in that world, in Bangalore city. So this has uh, changed, big change. Lots of institutions have come. Things have changed. The poverty was something many people have forgotten. And it was that India that I went to college in, uh, when I went to college, that was the India. Slowly institutions are coming. And I still remember uh, when I finished my bachelor's degree, I went to Benares University. I wanted to study in Benares because Benares University had a tremendous uh, reputation. I, I had a very wonderful stay in Benares. Benares was there place where I, I started my first research, whatever that meant. For a master's degree, you have to do partly research, partly coursework. And it was there, you see, that uh, I really decided to become a scientist. It was there I read a very famous book by a great chemist called Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling's Nature of the Chemical Bond. When I read that, I said, my God, that's exactly the kind of research I want to do. Structure of molecules, how chemical bonds are formed, how various things that he wrote about at that time. So it was in that atmosphere which I ended up in the US, I did my PhD and I, uh, though I had, I was supposed to work on molecular structure by electron diffraction of gases, that I did. It was then, you see, that I had two offers from India. One was the lowest possible academic position in Indian Institute of Science and then another was with Punjab University as a reader, but I didn't want to join there. I thought I would go to a place where there is a possibility of doing some research of a different kind. But there were only one or two places where there were reasonable facilities. One was the NCR Pula, not too bad at the time compared to other places. And then, what do I do? So it was here that I had to uh, make a very major decision. What is it one does that one does in India with almost no facilities, no foreign exchange available for chemicals or equipment, uh, still do something that everybody notices. It was then I decided I would going to pick an area where, where very few people are working, see? And that was very important. I took an area uh, with nobody worked on much called the chemistry of solids, solid state chemistry. And it is that field that has become the mainstream of chemistry and science today. For uh, almost 50 and 55, 56 years. And I have grown with the subject, it has been a wonderful thing to grow with the subject and where you are able to contribute to it. This has been a very, uh, very interesting thing for me. And more than that, you know, the situation was so bad, nobody asked, how are you doing? What is your future? So nobody talked about future. Nobody talked about the, the big science that we now talk about. The, we, we go, we, we go a very, very unusual, in a very depressing place. But what has happened suddenly, see, this is a five minute summary of the past. What has happened now is we have built all kinds of institutions. I don't want to talk about the quality, evaluation, how good or bad they are. That is not we did build a lot of institutions. But it, what has happened in spite of that, others, but they have done a lot of things. Others are doing more. You see, South Korea, which got freedom at the same time, at the same time as India, is doing so well, it is probably one of the most prosperous countries in terms of science education and technology. But we are investing still 2% of our GDP on education. All of education, not higher education. And less than 1% of it. But just to make people go feel good, I say 1%, actually it's over 0.9 probably. Maybe even 1%, but let us say 1%. What is interesting to me is, Mashak Karne, remember, I used to be chairman of the Science Advisory Council to Rajiv Gandhi. At that time, P.V. Narasimha Rao was Minister for Education. Narasimha Rao had a national policy for education that was uh, formed at the time. And we all helped him to write many chapters in that. And in that, he clearly states, we must increase our investment in education to 6% of the GDP. But when he became Prime Minister, he completely forgot about it. It remained 2%. <laughs> it still remains 2% today. And science again remains 1%, though every Prime Minister says, it will be made 2%. I'm not going to fight about money today. I'm just saying that one of the facts. More than that, it is not only the money, something about doing science. 
Similarly, uh, our society has lost respect for scholarship. Bangalore is no longer the city where uh, you have a book institute where you have lectures like in the old days in the different city. So people want to make money. Money has become very important. Now, nothing against business, but business cannot be alone run India. I think it has to have other things. So money has become a big thing. Today, of course, the, the children, the young children today after school uh, have made up their minds before they understand science, before they understand engineering, uh, before that they make up minds uh, of various professions. So this is one big change in value system. Well, I don't see any respect for scholarship and science particularly. I have not seen a major headline on science in the front page of any newspaper in the last 30 years. So this is what I mean the value system. So you don't expect secondary science to be, become a good thing in India. If you have a society which has no great respect for writers and scholars and so on, I don't see, of course, journalism is only a part, journalism is only a part of it. You have a medium, I don't want to blame the media, the entire thing. If you don't mind, it's really my, uh, uh, my uh, personal view. To be a success in India, you have to have a sense of humor. <laughs> Second, self-criticism, you should be a, a, a shy about being criticized. And, uh, uh, you have to prepare for that because the Indian society is one where you, they find fault very easy. They are always waiting for somebody to make a mistake. So if you make five good experiments, the sixth will face and I will go, oh yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, science is based on mistakes. Unless you make a good mistake, you will not make a good science later. Good mistakes are very, very useful and I think very important. And more than that, personal qualities. For this beauty, my, my personal view, you know, anyone who has too much envy, too much jealousy, too much anger cannot be creative. You know, the best of scientists in India are a bit conservative and they stick to some old line and so on. It's okay normally, but not always. In, at least in my area, I can't be like that. Unless you keep up with the times and keep changing, as often as necessary, I think it will be difficult to make a point to yourself. And uh, as I told you also, uh, it's very easy to be very depressed in India when you are doing really good stuff. You have a lot of failures. So many things are against you. Money is not available. Somebody is available. Something like that. So you have extraordinary patience. So yesterday I told somebody, some young people in uh, uh, the Pune Engineering College, the most important qualities for success in India are dedication, doggedness, and tenacity. Brilliance is the last quality required. I think it will be required for science, <laughs> but that is data. First, we must have dedication and doggedness. As you know, the number of scientists per capita, India is very small. Even in that, the number of people who are determined to accomplish and do big things is very, very small. Scientists are scientists who mean business, scientists who want to be the best, scientists who want to be the greatest, scientists who compete, scientists who won't give up. <laughs> but God apparently only favors those who have suffered pain. If you have not done human suffering, you have not had pain in life, he will not favor you. I think that's true of science. You will not succeed in science in India and you have unless you have suffered this. And I guess in the, people are afraid to suffer. Maybe that is why God doesn't favor Indian science. <laughs> what does one do, therefore? What do I do? What did, how did I spend my life trying my best to do whatever I can to, do, to, to reach the highest level possible in science? I will create new waves myself. So we need people who make waves in Indian science and engineering. When I say science, please add engineering to it. To me, engineering is a science. Actually, it is. In fact, some of the greatest scientists today in the world are engineers. In India, we should give an opportunity for people to think differently in such a way. Engineers become physical chemists, physical chemists become theoretician, theoretician do work with experimental. And there is no difference because creative ideas have no discipline. And to do that in India is not easy. That's why people give up. I always used to think of Great scientist name, great scientist always inspired me. I don't know whether you people, people pray to God. I also pray to God in my own way, but more important, find inspiration from great scientists. In fact, uh, I, the other day I quote, quoted uh, Sant Kabir, Kabir Das. You remember his famous Kabir Das composition, Maname Ganga, Maname Kashi, Maname Snanakaru. Exactly everything is Maname Hasa. So the, the same thing in science that we need people whose minds are set that they won't give up, they are there, it is embedded permanently. So they won't do science because of government, prime ministers, their speeches and stupid things we see every day in the paper. 
I, these are the people in India requires. And you know, another thing is, we able to, the selfishness of humans that has taken over, as Gandhiji would say, the day India becomes more selfish, I worry about India of that day. Selfishness of the worst kind is one that prevents creativity. Unless, as my great guru, Dr. Kerkar used to tell me always, in Ayat Kanpur, you know, sometimes I worry about India, I would say, because Indians have to choose them, even when they play, they are playing for their own going to hell or heaven, whatever they are going, heaven. <laughs> but uh, they have never played for a common good of man. So this selfishness is not a good thing for India. And in fact, we also get usually lost by triviality. With the number of scientists that go for coffee in my institute, four times a day is the minimum. Our habits are terrible. We don't work hard, we are the least hardworking people of the world. Yes, the science yeah. Show me a man who will do that in India, retires, then pick up the problem with the Yes, That's it. You see, one, uh, I used to go very regularly when I was alive. He died in 93, the year he died, he had four publications. And for 91, here I was, I go to Bangalore, from Bangalore I go to spend two, three days in Delhi. And you know, he was bent down, looking like that old man, 91, he was a very calm man. Never not, Professor Mott, what are you doing? You know, Professor, I'm correcting the proof of this paper. Get me a Professor and make your correcting proof of this paper. This is the problem. The dedication to science is absolute. As I used to tell Mashaka, it is like worshipping Saraswati. If you want her to really be good to you, you have to completely sacrifice everything else you have. You want nothing else except knowledge and scholarship. Science is a big like that. If you want to be a great scientist, you really rule the world because you are a great man, a great thinker. You have to boost a lot more. Well, I don't want to go on. Except that, you know, uh, the time scale, only two more minutes, I'll close my lecture. Two more minutes, I'll say what things which are really important. You mentioned everything I said. The science of time is something the India has to not be. Nobody is in a hurry. My God, the world is going in a hurry. And then somebody, and the other day, somebody said as a joke, well, you know, we are in a hurry. What about hurry? Why not Krishna, he said. <laughs> so that is what I'm, the hurry is uh, <laughs> something else. So the, the reason is, make a Faraday again, very nicely fix it. There's a beautiful recent book on uh, electric light for Faraday. There are many books, and this one is a very nice one. In that it, I have never read this before. Uh, somebody writes to Michael Faraday and says, Mr. Faraday, you have not replied to my letters. Why is that? He says, you know, I am very busy. And he writes this following. What is the long, longest and the shortest thing in the world? The swiftest and the most slow. The most divisible and the most extended. The least valued and the most regretted. Without which nothing can be done. And which devours all that is small and gives life and spirit to everything that is great. It is what the Creator thought as so valuable. He has only given a limited amount of it to all of us. That is time. If the Creator thought like time, time is easy, he would have given for 500 years, he would have given years for 500. 100, he had to do everything in that. Trust me, 100. And you know, India, we have to realize this, at least in science. Scientific problems and engineering problems will not remain because we didn't do the work. They will go on. We have to catch up. They will not stop because Indians are coming. No, nobody waits for India. Nobody waits for Indian scientists. There is no special consideration just because I am Indian, I pray to God every day. No, you pray to God and run. You have to keep running to remain stationary in science today. And we need people who run and remain stationary. And anyway, you know, I would like to close. In fact, my wife gave me a very wonderful quotation the other day of a man whom I admired a lot from my childhood. That was Bismillah Khan, famous musician. I used to know Bismillah Khan very well when I was a student in Benares. I used to go to his house. You know, he had a huge family. Even when he died, there were 50 people in his house meeting food. He didn't even know who they all were. He was one of those generous men. I remember Khan Sahib Aap Bajaye was the our hostel I could bajaye, Shaila bajaye. Aajaye! Can I invite you? I'm sorry, I switched to Hindi. Uh, he would come and he wouldn't even ask for any money. He never, never paid him any money. Play Shaila for one and a half hours, a free lunch in our hostel, he would go. 
In fact, the few years ago, I believe the concept is such a lie. Ravi, and again, I should explain the answer. And he said, nothing, you know, the only thing, why is it not possible, right? Thoda, you know, me is not a troublesome. So, Bhagavan to pratna karna, you know, but the petit se bait me karna. So, it's not possible, right? He was an unbelievable person for those who knew him. And he was interviewed just a few months before he died. People asked him, Thansa, what do you pray to God? What did you ask him? He said, oh God, let me be in the world of music as long as I live. That's all my prayer. That's all. I feel the same way. Oh God, let me be in the world of science as long as I live. I want to. That's all. But as Gita Jari, there is one towards the end, it says, Tego says, Time has says, time to say goodbye and uh, lock the door of the house, given away the keys. But you see, before I go, one thing I want to remember, remind you. This world has given me so much, but I have given so little back to the world. I feel exactly the same way. Science has given me so much. I wish I could have given science. Well. 